Someone's going to go for two and get it at some point. It's 1.42 in the morning. Yeah, that's all right. Number one. Shocker. Iron. Man, give me the Trojan ticket. There we go. Welcome into Overtime, presented by Perfection One. Alongside John Bruce, my name is Dewey Daly, as we welcome you into this week's show. Episode 46 of The Pod, and we've had some milestones Mm -hmm. this past week. We also had maybe one of the best games we've ever streamed in the history of Sosa on Mm -hmm. on the football side of things. It was pretty exciting, and going into a week that we thought may not have had the greatest slate, Mm -hmm. we had some pretty tight games. And uh, like I said, one of the best finishes we've had uh, in, I think, four years of streaming right. football games. So mm-hmm. uh, it was an exciting week for sure. Yeah. Uh, Along with the hurricane. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the hurricane, almost got to stop by Perfection 1 on right. Thursday. Coming right. back from Lucasville, I went to a soccer game. On the way back, a truck decided that he wanted to uh, switch lanes without acknowledging go. that I was driving next to him. And it was literally about 300 feet from where Perfection One is in Waverly. So nice. thankfully, we did not meet by accident that day, but uh, we appreciate our sponsors. And yeah, on the way down to that game on Friday, uh, me, Dewey, and Kenneth Hay, our, our cameraman, were driving. And I think when we got to Waverly, we weren't 100% sure that there was going to be a game. When we got to Lucasville, we weren't 100% sure there was going to be a game. <laughs> But thankfully, there was a game, and you know we'll talk about it at length later. But it was it was an instant classic. It was it was a great game. So we got a lot to talk about. Like you said, a lot of milestones. Um, you know, some stuff happened in, in you know the world of sport today. We did, we just uh, Pete Rose just passed away. Kimmy Matumbo passed away. Uh, the Mets beat the Braves in one of the greatest regular season baseball games ever. Like it was just a, it was a, kind of a wild Monday in sports overall and. You know, excited to get to talk about what happened last week in in the Southeast District and and what's going to happen this week as well. Yeah, we can go ahead and hop into the headlines for this week. A lot of milestones. We'll talk about Southeastern's Josie Lockheed, not only her 1,000th career dig, but her 1,000th career assist as well. Not too often you combine those two things, let alone in one week. Yeah, and I think I saw she's within 80 kills as well of a thousand that can't like that can't happen very often because usually if you get the thousand assists that means you're just a you're just a setter you know not just a setter but you're a setter that's your primary position yeah you can move all the way around and so you can get some digs as well so sometimes you see it but not very often with these two but you would almost never see it in kills now one thing i would really like to see it's probably too late to start it for like the SEC, but I would like to see each school have like a list of who's hit these milestones, like a thousand. If you want to say 500 kills, cause that's still a lot of kills. I mean, if you want to say that, like, because we have like thousand point lists around, but we don't have it for stats like this in volleyball. Um, we barely have it in soccer. We definitely don't have it in baseball. I'm pretty sure we don't in, uh, uh, softball either. Yeah. But like we have some, like some people have stuff in football, but that's, there's 10 games a year. It's a little easier to keep right. that stats, but yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing that she's been able to do this. I was there on Tuesday when she got her thousandth career dig and you know, it was pretty cool for them to stop the play and, or not stop the play, but after the point was won, uh, to where she's able to get celebrated, both teams give her a nice ovation, especially Huntington. Uh, then Thursday, she immediately gets the thousandth career assist, which kind of goes to show what kind of team player she is as well, because she was the SEC player of the year last year. She led the league by a lot in kills and just dominated at most times. And when their team's set primary setter has to sit the second half of the year, she volunteered to go over and do it. And she's done a really good job of it. And really probably sacrificing the chance to get to a thousand kills because it's going to be hard to get another 80 kills and eight games as primary setter. Right. You know, there's, there's a slight chance, but you know, you never know. And especially with how the, the tournament is now where a team like Southeastern maybe in the past might've won three, maybe played four 
tournament games. I don't know how many tournament games are even going to play right. because of so many different divisions now. So it's going to be split up a, a good bit. So uh, really impressive by her. I liked what I saw out of their team. They're very young. She's the only senior on that team, which goes even more to how unselfish she is to volunteer to go over and, and go back to a position she played earlier in her career at, as the primary setter when you know she's the go-to person. Right. But she knows the best chance for her team to win is to do that, and, and that's why uh, we're able to talk about her today. We're going to stay in Ross County for our second headline, Chillicothe's Grace Townsend. Talking about a thousand assists for Townsend, over two thousand career assists between her time at Adina and obviously spending her season, her senior season here mm-hmm. at Chillicothe. Yeah, and I believe she was o- over fifteen hundred or close to fifteen hundred at Adina, and she didn't really play much varsity as a freshman, if if any, because I know they had um, the Lovelies there um, on their last state team at Adina when she was a freshman. So I don't think she played very much. So to do that in only three seasons is super impressive. It just goes to show another one of those, like she could be an all around player too, but does a really good job uh, uh, at the setter position. I know she's, you know, kind of mixed in pretty well over there at Chillicothe. They're about 500, but I don't know how much they had coming back other than, uh, Hammond um, yeah you know so you know, you have a really good player coming back but you still have to put pieces around them and uh, Townsend's done a really good job of filling in in that role this year so 2,000 career assists is insane especially when you're when you're going different places um, you know and being able to you know just mix in it's volleyball has is so much on momentum and familiarity, knowing what everyone else is doing. So to switch that up in the middle of your career and still be able to do it at such a high level just shows what type of player that uh, Grace is and, you know, just just an outstanding overall athlete. And our last headline, three volleyball headlines Mm -hmm. for us this week. Jalen Reisner of Rock Hill. Hasn't been the greatest year for Rock Hill, sitting at 7-8 overall, 4-6 in the Ohio Valley Conference. One of the 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 most southern teams we yes. cover if that's the right way to put mm-hmm. it they're on the southern southern tip of ohio down yeah. there and i think they're also in ironton yeah uh, as well so we don't get down there a whole lot but uh for reisner we did see her a couple of years ago over at uh, rio grande not the rio grande, grande yeah. as it says on the bottom of their sheet for <laughs> uh college baseball it's like not not rio or not rio grande, grande. rio like, grande yeah uh, nonetheless, for Reisner, her 1,000th career kill for the Lady Redmen. And, you know, for a Rock Hill team that is a little bit under 500 in both league play and with an overall record of 7-8, and eight, she's been a bright spot mm-hmm. so far. Through 52 sets, 265 kills for Reisner, averaging 5.1 per set. And just quoting what Shane has said on the broadcast a couple times, you know, he'll say 3 per set is all league, 4 is you know, player of the year contention, then like five and six is just like, you don't hear it that much. Yeah. And, you know, we're a little over halfway through the season now and she's still, you know, one tenth above five percent. Mm-hmm. So it's been a great year for Reisner at the net. Well, and, and with the team being a little under 500, that means it, she, the attention is probably fully paid to her as well. So that's even more impressive to get that number on a team mm-hmm. where, you know, obviously someone's got to do it, but you also, you can kind of, slant your defense one way or the other. And one of the big things to remember in volleyball, in, in case you, you don't fully pay that much attention to it, you have rotations. So you, you're going to have at least three rotations where you're not, you can't actually hit at the net. And, you know, to be able to get 5.1 a set really shows, you know, how important she is to their team and to uh, any success that they're able to have. And also, really, for Reisner, you know, if you do the math, 7-8 and eight overall, so that's 15 matches, 52 sets on average that is under 3.5 sets per match. Yeah. So she's at 265, right, through 
through, you know, mm-hmm. only 52 sets. And I'm, you know, if maybe they were a little bit more competitive and, mm-hmm. you know, got to that fourth and fifth set a little more often, we could be talking about somebody who may have, you know, 300 assists at this point in the season. I'm sure she'll reach that before the season's end. But, uh, yeah, for this Rock Hill team, like we said, maybe not the season they were hoping for, mm-hmm. but for Reisner, it's uh, been an unforgettable season up to this point. So. Right, and, and it's kind of cool. We got to talk about someone with digs, a couple of people with assists, one of the mean the same person and then someone with kills so we get to talk about all three levels Bump of set spike or yeah whatever they say and I, I was talking to my i was talking to my dad on the way on the way down i was talking about the kind of new um some of the new setting rules a little bit how the different ball handling things and and the way i worded it was just you know how important each one of those levels is because i mean when he watched i think the last time he watched volleyball was when they were still it wasn't rally scoring so it was side outs and oh man like i think i've mentioned it before one of the years that westfall made it to the final four it was over at Wright state i was at Wright state at the time i went over and watched they lost like 15 to 15 0 something like that i think it was uh orville the uh bobby knight's hometown there you go it felt like it was the longest match ever because it they they kept getting like they would win a point or they would win a side out and then they would serve and would just keep switching. And then I looked a couple of years ago and it was like an hour and two minutes, but it felt so long because one team just wasn't actually scoring. So then rally scoring went in, I think the next year. And like the first match I saw, I was like, Oh, this is so much better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Even if it's just, you know, getting the team points up, it, it is so much better. But uh, yeah, so I think that might be a reason why some of the, we don't have as tight of records in volleyball because you know, with going from rally scoring or turning it into rally scoring, I think maybe some, some uh, stats are probably a little increased now than what they were, especially when you're going to five sets instead of three, cause it was only three sets at that time. But yeah. Oh, it's, so like it was best to three all the time. Yeah. It was and the third set. It was to 15. 15. Yeah. But yeah, it was a, uh, it's a fun sport. I think we play like we, we play at a really good level in this area. I, I know you guys aren't streaming a game this week, but should be a couple of big ones next week, right? Yeah, so it's Wheelersburg at South Webster Tuesday and Fairfield Union at Circleville on Thursday. Yeah, so that's... that's I'll a- have to check before we move on to our football because um, we, we talked on the pod, it was either last week or the week before that Fairfield Union and Circleville at Fairfield Union oh, the yeah. first time around got postponed and at the time of recording, they hadn't posted a makeup date yet. Um, and now they have it at 10 7, which it's I think Monday. is a Monday. Yep. So that's next Monday, yep. I believe. So that we'll one is at Fairfield twice. Union. So they'll, and then, so they're going to play Monday and then they're going to play Thursday of next week. So I guess that could be a game we technically preview. Yeah, in this episode, but uh, we'll just wait and preview the yeah, so, Thursday one. Uh, at the at the end, we're not gonna we're not gonna go like really in depth previews. We're gonna kind of just go over games to watch for this this week. Uh, keep in mind that one for next week. Yeah, uh, Circleville at Two Fairfield Union on Monday. All right, we move on to the recaps. Only one of them, as finding box scores is a little bit difficult <laughs> for our area. And there were two games that you know you kind of wanted to talk about: Harvest Prep. Uh, well, I guess I should say Wheelersburg only loses to Harvest Prep twelve to six. They kicked two field goals. I think Harvest Prep scored twice and failed mm. the two pointer both times. Um, I think maybe a lot of people thought Wheelersburg, including myself, might lose a little more handedly than uh, that. Yeah. So Dewey a couple weeks ago mentioned that as a possibility to maybe go and stream that game, and we decided we'd go with two teams that are in our area. But also, we didn't particularly think that was going to be that close of a game. No. And maybe the weather helped. I don't know. I don't know how the weather was. We were at least an hour south of there, probably an hour and a half from, you know, in Lucasville. Yeah. So 12-6, I mean, I, I feel like Wheelersburg is... That, I bet that was such a boring game, though. Yeah. Like 12-6, that's <laughs> bad. But I, I feel like Wheelersburg might be getting closer to what we kind of expected. You know, the, they've got a big one, you know, next week. You know, they should win again this week and then they got a big one next week at, at Waverly. So it's going to be a, you know, that, that was, you know, one of the two really interesting games yeah. in that region 
because the other one was... Well, I was going to... What were you? I was going to talk about Clarkson and, That's and Ironton. Yeah. Yep. The top, arguably the top two teams in the region, which would be Harvest Prep and Ironton, both were in for dogfights when I don't know if anyone actually fully expected that to be I, I didn't, that way. I, you know, I didn't know what to expect out yeah, of the Ironton Clarkson yeah, game. I heard, I've read that the Clarkson North's team was basically just like a Juco team mm-hmm. and their linemen were all like 6'5 and junk. Did you see Terry's punt return? He's so good. <laughs> he's so he's so, he's yeah, so ridiculous. That was a little like, ridiculous. You know, obviously we want we want the teams from our area to do well anyway, but I want him to be able to make it to a state championship game and be able to do something like cool like that. Like that would be like he's he's so fun to watch. He's so hard to bring down. And if he could do it on the on the statewide level, kind of kind of like a kind of like what Joe Burrow did when he was at Athens was, you know, we all knew it. We all knew how good he was at the time, but then he gets to play the state championship game. And I think ever and they played it was I don't know if they still do like one game on Thursday, but they were the Thursday night game and they ended up I think they lost like 55 or 56, 52. And he just went ballistic in the game, though. And like everyone was like, oh. This guy's a dude. And I feel like Sean Terry could do that same thing if he gets the opportunity. And I think the Siren team is good enough to do it. But I also think this is probably a good thing. You know, it's not the worst thing to lose a game. Right. You know, th- now, uh, also, shout out to Franklin Furnace Green for allowing yep. Ironton to come over and play because they had some damage to the Tanks Memorial Stadium, which, you know, we'll see what the damage ends up being. Um for where they're going to play the rest of the season at. But, yeah, they're able to get over to green and play. It probably helps that they were playing a Canadian team that wasn't going to bring a real big crowd. But, um, yeah, just really good win for Clarkson North. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, this, this Iron team is really good. Um, tough to beat a tough to beat a country. Right. All right, well, we'll go ahead. We'll, wow. We will go ahead and recap the uh, game we streamed last week. One of the few games, I think it was more or less split, into half the games that were played mm-hmm. on Friday and Saturday. I think maybe a little bit more were played Saturday morning and a little early after. They were kind of all spread out. There were some at 10, some at noon, two, seven. Tens. They were. Now, the good thing is I was working at the, at the baseball stadium and I was able to watch a bunch of games because, you know, like you said, they watch. were spread out. <laughs> I kind of, I didn't watch the, I didn't watch the baseball games. I was at <laughs> Cause we didn't run the scoreboard because, um, yeah, did I tell you that? Yeah. Yeah. So uh one of the schools was not happy that there were leaves on the ground from the massive storm that came through the night before. So All right. I was, well, I was pumped. <laughs> we can go ahead and talk about Northwest and Lucasville Valley in week six. Valley coming out with the win, thirty eight to thirty five, the second consecutive season that Lucasville has picked up their first win over Northwest in Week 6, so they've started off the last two years 0-5. Ended up making the playoffs last year, so we'll see what they can do this year. As somebody who saw them in Week 1 and saw them in Week 6, they look a lot better, a lot more comfortable. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obviously, Valley without Gabe McNeil. We'll get into their backfield a little bit more here in a minute. But uh, for Northwest, they're now 3-3, 1-2 in the SOC 2 Great game from Carter Runyon, a great two-game stretch for Mm -hmm. the senior. Against Valley, he had 245 rushing yards on 27 carries, four touchdowns for Runyon. He now has seven in the team's last two games. Maybe not the greatest game for Colton Campbell. Still a great game Mm -hmm. as a high school football player, but maybe what we'd seen from Campbell this season. He was held to under three yards per carry, 25 totes for 74 yards. And then Jake Brown, a nine-yard... If you, have, if you didn't watch the stream, you should probably go you back and watch, watch this. Yeah. I think it was their last touchdown they scored, or maybe the second to last. But Jake Brown, a nine-yard rushing touchdown on a ball that... And if you haven't watched Northwest play, it's all wing T. I think they lined up in the gun or pistol one time yeah. the whole night. And Jake Brown fumbles the snap straight down, and he just picks it up and just off the right edge into the end zone from yeah, nine it, yards it, out. And it was a fourth down also. So it was definitely going to go to Carter Runyon. And then shout out to Runyon because he led the way on the block. Right. And uh, yeah, Jake Brown, he, he only, he only ran it twice. He only threw it once, but you know, it was an incompletion. I think he had 12 yards on the other run, but mostly, you know, going out of the wing tee. I, I, I feel like 
you know, there was a couple times where they maybe missed opportunities to, you know, maybe force it to run in, especially because there was one play where Campbell was out of the game and they ended up losing a fumble on it where instead of, like they just went back to the person who replaced Campbell. I'm like, I would just go to the guy right. averaging almost 10 a carry, but um, you know, running also recovered a fumble on defense. He had a 70, 71 yard touchdown run, which might've been a fourth down. It was at least third. I think it was four. It was like yeah. fourth and one. Yeah. He bounced to the outside and then just outran everybody. He had one spin move down the yeah. sideline where I think that was the drive that Brown maybe I think it was took that fumble in mm-hmm. too. Yeah. He, it was just Carter running was awesome all night long. And, you know, I thought Valley did a really good job of slowing down Campbell. They did not do a very good job of slowing down running, but they made a play when it mattered. It was, um, uh, Zach Witt was able to get yeah. a hit on him when it was a fourth and three. He hit him about a yard downfield and was able to bring him down a yard short of the line to gain, which ended up leading to Valley's game winning field goal, which we'll talk about here. In a second. Yeah. <laughs> For Valley, they're one and five, their first win of the season, now one and two in the SOC two. Aiden Wattell, he aired it out in mm-hmm. the first half. I'm not sure how many passes they attempted in the second half. Not a not lot. Often. Uh, yeah. But he was 12 for 19 for 178 yards, two touchdowns through the air. You could give him two rushing touchdowns if you want, maybe one and a half rushing touchdowns and give the other half to Zach Witt as that was a <laughs> that was yeah. I think it was maybe designed to go to Witt, but it was sort of a mis uh, it was a, a little bit in the backfield a, and it was a little bit like the Jake Brown score except yeah. for this one was up the middle and Witt just kind of like tackled his own quarterback into the end zone uh-huh. which was. It was fun to see, yeah. but you know they got the score nonetheless. I think that may have been on. That fourth was their last down. score. Was it? Was that on fourth down though? It may have been. It was. It was from the one. I, I don't know. It, it was. It was a wild play. But uh, on the other end of Wattell's passes, Braxton Conaway was the bright spot. Five catches, one hundred five yards, two touchdowns. Uh, we also saw Blake Lundy get in on the action. Lex Logan and Isaiah Sparks also had a few catches as well. Um, uh, Witt had a couple. Yeah, Witt, yeah. Witt had a. He have a, did he have catches? Two. Two, two for okay. 25. I wasn't sure if he had any catches or just a couple carries. but uh, And then kind of the highlight of the night for Lucasville Valley, Jalen Bender, 5 of 5 on PATs, and then knocked down a 46-yard game-winning field goal as time expired, a new school record for Bender and Lucasville Valley. We'll talk about this game in a little bit, but Valley at West this week, that's a matchup I'll be interested to see if yeah, that should Valley be. can keep this thing going. Yeah, I I was slightly disappointed with how they did against the run. Now the wing tees, you know, a different type of run, but it was kind of fun to watch the two completely different offenses in the first half. Uh, play to a 14-14 stalemate, but it was Northwest was wing tee, run, 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 run. In the first half, Valley ran Anthony Aaron one time for six yards, he ended the game with 21 carries for 140. Yeah. Almost all of that in the second half. And you could tell he was just wiped out late in the game, which is, um, you know, they they got a play over the middle. They kind of set things up. And then Aid Wattel got sacked. They were able to, you know, I, I know he was frustrated, but he was heady enough to get everyone to the line. They spiked it, I think, with two seconds left. Two or three. Yeah, think, it was yeah. it was closing down, but, you know, things could have gone sideways in a hurry now i know that kick was further than they wanted it to be but i mean it was good probably from 50 yeah he knocked it down yeah and i still don't know what the wind was doing exactly but (laughs) earlier in that game that ball would have either been good from 70 (laughs) because of the wind or good from about 20 because of the wind because the wind was crazy right before kickoff and then after kickoff it it was kind of it had been kind of a relaxing night. I thought mm-hmm. the weather ended up being really good yeah. after how crazy it was all day. Uh, Bender also had a couple of touchbacks. He's he, this dude like he's kick, only a junior. Yeah. Too. Kicking in the Southeast district. I'll say 10 years ago was not good. Like I remember Westfall, I think it was 15 years ago now ended up making it to the final four. And they were one of the only teams that actually had a kid that could actually make a field goal. Everybody else, it was like, uh, you know, hopefully we can make extra points. A lot of teams just going for two. And now you got kids like Jalen Bender, um, Maddox. Uh, Spriggs. Spriggs for was, Northwest. was five for five for Northwest. He hit a couple of long ones in pregame, too. So, mm-hmm. I mean, um, you've got kids. Uh, I mean, 
last week, Judah Hanks for Zane Trace hit a field goal at the end of the first half from the right hash. They end up winning the game by three. So it it ends up kicking has evolved in the Southeast District where it's it's no longer a kind of hindrance. It's it's a something teams can use. And like you mentioned with Wheelersburg, they kicked a couple field goals. Uh, it's like forty two Bre- and forty yards or mm-hmm. something. They were pretty long too. Yeah. So it's it's a it, it makes the game better. Like to have that option because I think it was. I was looking through somebody's stats earlier. I think it's uh, Logan Elm. Sorry if I can't remember his name right now, but he's seven for nine on field goals on the year. And we're in, you know, through week six. So that's, that's pretty good to know that you have that option at this point. So a uh, very good game. I would say, you know, you mentioned it in the pre-show, like, you know, maybe the best football game we've ever done. And, you know, and that's this year so far, we've had games decided by th- we haven't had a game that we covered to continue to to full because week two we had some <laughs> issues happen. But yeah, that was um, a rough. Week. Every other every other game has been a one score game, and multiple came down to the last play. So it's pretty uh pretty exciting. Awesome for Jalen Bender to be able to get some redemption there in week six and win it for his team. Uh, also, it was homecoming. It was. They didn't really do the homecoming stuff on the field because. I don't think they knew if it was going to stop raining before uh, like nine because the game started late too. So uh, if you're able to watch it, we appreciate it. If you haven't, just make sure you, you go back and check it out. Do we had a good uh, comment to start the game? I did. Yeah, I watched that back. I showed that to, uh, I showed that to Caleb the other <laughs> day. He thought it was hilarious. So I thought it was pretty, it was pretty good. Pretty funny. Yeah. It was, it was really clever. I was trying to find, Oh, um, Maggie Wilson. They they might have a girl on their team kicking. And seven or nine? Maggie Wilson. Nice. Unless I've never met a guy named Maggie, so probably not. You but, never know. Yeah. It's hard to assume, but Yeah. <laughs> we'll take it. Well what if Maggie Wilson is seven for nine. Uh nineteen of twenty on PATs mm-hmm. for um for Logan, Logan Elm. So nice. Uh, and for Northwest, they're back in McDermott against Fenton County this week. I would venture to say they will probably be on the positive side of 500 once again. After this week, I would probably pick them to uh, win that game. So, Yeah, I believe uh, Broccoli will be there. I would say Allegedly. you're probably right. Yeah. We only had one article go out this week. so Yeah, it, was, it wasn't a banner weekend for us at uh, <laughs> Sosa, but, you know, it doesn't help whenever you're you have multiple writers that can't cover stuff on Saturday, which was like Carson had to. I'm sure was doing something back at OU because he always covers stuff on Saturdays down there. So he his game got pushed to Saturday. Derek's game got pushed to Saturday. He definitely didn't have power Friday night. I don't know if Brock had power Friday night. He ended up getting to a game, but his game was forty one nothing. So we didn't have anything there. Um, you had something going on during the day to where you couldn't just like skip it out. Me and Kenneth had to work at the stadium. So it ended up just, we didn't have a whole lot of extra coverage, but I think we'll be able to ramp that back up this week. Um, with a, with a big weekend in week seven, we got a big one coming up. So I'm pretty excited for that. Football. Yeah. Oh yeah. But first we will, um, go over our power rankings. These shouldn't take too long as uh, there wasn't a whole lot of movement, but, uh, before we get into the power rankings, John, did you know that Perfection One Collision Center has served Southern Ohio families and student athletes for over 30 years? No. Well, you should, because I said it last week, too. Oh. They're one of the oldest collision centers in the state, serving Pickaway, Ross, and Pike counties, featuring state of the art equipment, technology, manufacture, and manufacturing certifications. Certifications may vary by location. Perfection One, we meet by accident and are highly recommended. So. Well,. It's uh, also one of the newest in Pike County yeah. as the one up by the sheriff's office is a newer location. I, I believe it's been there a little over a year. I almost got to meet them on accident. You almost uh, had to recommend them to somebody. Yes, I'm glad I did not have to personally recommend them. I hopefully never have to. We appreciate them. But if we do need a recommendation, we know where to find it at Perfection One. There you go. Yeah. All right, let's knock these power rankings out as 
you have the exact same ones and I just flip flopped. Well, you, your flip flopping was probably smart. I I'm, I'm very bullish on the pirates. So number one, I originally, my number one was mother nature. (laughs) Uh, I was going to put Ironton as one a, but I think football beat mother nature on Saturday by being able to play then too. So uh, mother nature does not make it into the, power rankings mm-hmm. but i got ironton the fighting tigers number one they you know they uh fairland portsmouth probably not gallia but gallia coming up some other teams in our area get a chance at them in the next few weeks we'll see how close some of these teams are to them or how far ironton is from them so uh my number two is the fairland dragons as they just keep rolling you know, alleged injuries that we don't know. We can't, we tried to verify tonight. We don't know for sure. Um, we're going to just guess there's, there's not because the non-verification, uh, it doesn't really matter. Fairland keeps rolling. Jackson just absolutely dominant. You'll see on the scoreboard below at some point, uh, if they were going by now, I would have been real pumped. <laughs> Was it Nelsonville and Megs? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh I got iron or it's 55, nothing over McLean. Yeah. 55, nothing. It's pretty good. So Jackson stays there. Uh, I kept Wheelersburg at four probably could have done some movement there, but I think harvest prep's really good. So I, I think more than likely harvest prep and Ironton are playing in a regional final and for, you know, Wheelersburg to be in a one possession game with them. I think, I think they've gotten a lot better since week two. You know, probably could have dropped them, but, you know, I didn't. So that's, <laughs> how, it, that's how it is. Uh, I got Miami Trace at number five. Paint Valley, number six. One of the things for Paint Valley, and we'll kind of talk about when we talk about them with Piketon, they haven't played a team over, that is currently over 500, and they won't, if they win this week, they won't until week nine. So I, like, I'm pretty sure they're really good, but what they've played so far, it's, it's not the toughest schedule. Um, normally West Jefferson's a lot better than they are. Blanchester and McLean, not really, but, um, you know, West Jefferson normally is a really, really tough team, but they're two and four right now. And, you know, overall they, you know, haven't played the toughest, but they've got a three-headed monster on offense. They've got a couple of extra players that um, are able to make plays for them. Their defense has improved. It's it's a good team. They they got a shutout this week against Adina, who's an improved team, but uh, they also gave up like close to fifty points against them last year. So that's it's obviously an improved team for Bear, for the Paracats. Uh, number seven, I have Logan Elm. The only thing for Logan Elm that I would say right now, they're giving up a lot of points. They're they're scoring a lot, obviously, but they're giving up a lot of points too. They they uh I mean they gave up what they gave up against St. Trace. They gave up like a, a kind of big number against St. Trace and St. Trace didn't have a quarterback in week one. So kinda of I think it was like twenty seven in that uh, game. Uh thirty three twenty seven. Yeah. So they're a good team. I mean, obviously Aaron Walters is very good. Michael Bach has been going crazy mm-hmm. but like i mean four touchdowns this week mm-hmm. and a bunch of like 283 yeah or something. he's close to he's close to a thousand yards right now so so far they've given up 27 14 41 17 20 21 they're at bloom carroll this week uh fantastic 50's got him projected oh my bad Michael Bach had 38 carries for 293 and six touchdowns. Oh, only six touchdowns. Yeah, Michael Bach is a beast. And and that kind of shows what Miami Trace's defense, how good Miami Trace's defense is, because he had a very pedestrian game against them. So, um, you know, Logan Elm, keep rolling. But, you know, at Bloom Carroll this week going to be really, I, I think they should pretty handily win the last three weeks of the season. The Alexander game kind of is a weird throw in there in, in week nine, but uh hey, that's a good that's a good senior night game. I mean <laughs> that's that's a really good senior night game. Now for Logan Elm, almost everybody that does anything for them skill wise is a senior. So this is the year for them to if they're gonna make another run. And I do think offensively they've they've got the skills to do it. I would like to see them just defensively get a little t- tighten things up a little bit. Um, this week, unless it's 
unless it's bad, I don't really see a whole lot of movement happening with them because Bloom, I think we agree, would probably be number two in our rankings yep. if they were in our coverage area. But, you know, alas, they are not. Uh, number eight, I have Portsmouth. Once again, the keep rolling. Really impressed with what the Trojans have done. Excited to see them this week, uh, allegedly in our in our game. You know, I don't know why I said allegedly. I think it's already been announced. It is. So wow. yeah, it's been announced. Uh, ninth, I have Uniota, uh, twenty-one to twelve win over Piketon. Isaac Coy is is so efficient. Uh, he was thirteen to sixteen. The last one was a drop, and it was in it was in the rain. So they didn't really throw the ball a lot in the second half. A lot of it was Cody Braden, who's really kind of exploded for them. He had 200 yards of total offense in that game. So they're up three scores at the half and kind of took the foot off the gas. Um, but overall, they've been pretty good. Um, and five of the six games this year, they have not given up a point in the first half. There you go. Yeah. Are they you only, talking about Portsmouth? No, you need to go. Oh, sorry. I was. But I think, I think they only have one shutout, though. So that, that might be the only thing to look at on that is, you know, make sure you're finishing those games strong. But, I mean, they've given up 8, 27, 14, 0, 14, 12. So they got a home game against Adina this week and then a couple of big ones that we will probably be at with uh, Zane Trace and Paint Valley coming up. And then 10th, I have the Athens Bulldogs who get another good win this week over Warren, which now until they play Nelsonville York, that's probably going to be it for them being really pushed. It's week nine. Those two. Oh, no, week nine is, I think it's week nine. I think is Nelsonville and Vinton County. I think week eight might be those two potentially. Um, uh, week eight is Wellston. So they got Megs this week projected win by 39. Wellston projected one by 35, River Valley by 49, and then Nelsonville it says projected by 23, but I don't. I would like to go back and look at those games to see if anyone ever wins by that much, except for when Joe Burrow plays. So I think because I mean they're they're down the road from each other. It's a little bit like Northwest and Valley, yeah. except for you know one is a significantly bigger school in Athens and Nelsonville, but Nelsonville has a great football history, so. Um, That'll be one to keep an eye on for for show. All right. I think we should go back to our one through twenty next week. You do, yeah, just for funsies next week. Okay, next yeah, week. Last last week, if you didn't watch, uh, we did do one through twenty. I might update mine as if we did them this week, mm -hmm. but we're not going to actually do them this week just because. Uh, I don't know why, but it is you know it is what it is. <laughs> All right, uh, it is what it is. I'll quickly go through my top ten. Uh, Ironton loses the, to the Canadian team, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it, like the heart foundation, it'd be hard to drop them. Right. They got a matchup with Fairland coming up, uh, I think in week nine, maybe or week eight sometime around then. Uh, that's really the only, the, I mean, really the Fairland and the Portsmouth game are the only two that they could lose at this point that, uh, would warrant them getting dropped whatsoever, especially the Fairland games. We could potentially I, see it hey, in number I'll, one. If, I'll say this. If that were to happen, uh, Pikeville is two and four. So I don't know what that even means uh, in comparison to their schedule, but I'm just throwing out there they're only two and four. And then Fairland, you know, it, you're not going to drop a team that you already have up there that um, gets another win. I was trying to, like, remember who they played. But, uh, South uh, Point, yeah, South 36, Point, 36 to nothing. Uh, and then Jackson, like we said, 55 to nothing over McLean, so they're going to stay. Miami Trace. Uh, another win in the FAC. Paint Valley still undefeated overall, 3-0 in the league. Uniota and Wheelersburg, I did flip. You know, for Wheelersburg, I know if there was a spread, they probably covered it by a lot. Um, but, and, and, like, honestly, I'll say Wheelersburg, without a doubt, probably the third best team on the list. I think Wheelersburg probably beats every team above them besides the two that they lost to mm -hmm. in Jackson and Ironton. Um, but it's hard to have a two and four team above some of these other teams. And, you know, it, it's the curse of having a extreme, an extremely tough strength of schedule. Mm -hmm. Um, so Uniota beats Piketon on the road, 21 to 12. So I bumped them up to six and I bumped Wheelersburg down to seven. Logan Elm, 41 to 21 over Liberty Union, I believe. Yes. Um, so, you know, they're still at eight and then, uh, Portsmouth at nine and Athens at 10, 
So we've got a, well, I guess you have Portsmouth at eight. So we have a two versus eight and a half game yeah. coming up this week in our power ranking. So yeah, uh, we'll talk about that game here in a little bit. But. Yeah, and according to the computers, should be close. Who knows? In reality. Now, of course, we would. it would be this game that would be the one that wouldn't be close for us after all the close games we've had so far. But, um, yeah, that's. I, I think at this point you kind of see – teams kind of falling into place on where where they're expected to be i'm not sure maybe i mean fairland i think was been the surprise of the season because early in the season we both thought miami trace was going to be really good you know um any paint valley maybe they're a little more dominant than we expected to well, I don't know. I think maybe the West Jeff game is the only yeah. game up to this point. I think Paint Valley could have lost. And yeah. They won it pretty handedly. So. Yeah. So, yeah. I, Athens also, I mean, they, they've, like, according to, like, the strength of schedule, it, it's been one of the worst in the state. But at the same time, they haven't really been pushed at all. So, yeah. kudos to them on that. I, I just don't know. I don't, I don't think there's a... Nothing too shocking so far. I think to some of our colleagues, there's a couple of teams that have not been as good that people that they would maybe be surprised about. But for some kinda, reason, yeah, we kind of knew coming into things. Um, but yeah, I, I just think that, you know, there, there are some teams that are coming on late. I think Eastern Pike, even though we don't have them in our top 10, Portsmouth West, I had, I was, I was less, bu- less bullish on Portsmouth West to start the year than you were, but. Um, those two, I think, have been better. Wouldn't I have been less bullish on them? I don't know. I Isn't don't, bullish whenever you're high on them? Yeah. So I, you were more bullish than yeah. I was. You had them at like eight or something. Yeah. I did never had them in. So, and then especially after Fairland put it on them in week one, they've been a lot better, I think, than we expected. Eastern Pike lost a lot of skill guys, and they're still undefeated. So, you know, it's there's some, been some pleasant surprises as well. So, um who else could we throw out there? That's a pleasant surprise. Um, uh, I mean, I know Amanda lost this past week, but who did they lose to? Hamilton. Yeah, lost by a point. Uh, Wellston. I mean, Rock Hills five and one chance to go. Who do they play this week? I think it's got to go this week. So probably going to be six and one after this week. I mean, it's obviously a playoff team. Yeah. Um, Wellston's yeah. been pretty solid. Yeah, Wellston five and one. That's probably about it. Yeah, I mean, r- really, I mean, if... I mean, Zane uh, Trace has rattled off four, four wins in a row or mm, three wins in a row, however many. Yeah, and then they've got... It is, it's No, it's four in a row, isn't it? Mm-mm. It, it will be. <laughs> but, no, not yet. Well, they've played six games. Oh, yeah, yeah they lost they, their first three. Yeah. They can't count. Yeah, three in a row. Yeah. Um. <laughs> let me see. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think we got some we got some improved teams... And you know we we've got some exciting players in our in our area. I will say the most exciting is definitely Sean Terry. Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to some of our game previews coming up this week. We've got three games that we're going to talk about, and we will start with uh, the game we'll be broadcasting this week: Fairland at Portsmouth. Most likely the OBC title game, as it seems. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fairland and Portsmouth are more or less head and shoulders above the rest of the league. You know, Cole Grove has had its moments. Obviously, Rock Hill currently 5-1, and one, but, you know, the strength of schedule hasn't really been there for Rock Hill. Mm-hmm. But, you know, maybe we just haven't seen them against another good team, and they could end up being uh, a team that, um, you know, maybe has a has a chance to, to win this mm-hmm. conference. We'll see down the stretch uh, for them as them and Gallia play this weekend. Hasn't been the greatest year for Gallia up to this point. Right. But uh, for Fairland and Portsmouth, as it stands, according to Fantastic 50, Portsmouth is a one-point favorite, so... Uh, more or less a toss-up down at the Coliseum. I read online, uh, said that home field advantage is more or less, like, worth one and a half points. Mm-hmm. And, but we're talking about, like, the NFL now. Right. So uh, about as toss-uppy as a, as a toss-up game can I, get I'm gonna uh, say, between these two teams. I'm going to say on Fantastic 50, it is at least two points because... Home and, field? Yeah, because... So you think Fairland should be plus one is what you're saying? Yeah, so what – because I'm, I'm going to just let you know on their overall rankings. I, I personally, before – well, 
I'll let you go ahead. Well, on their overall rankings, this is going to, you know, our, we cut, we talk about and cover these teams and might have went to the school. Um, but they've got Union at a 318th in the state and Paint Valley is 319. And in week nine, they have Union as a two point favorite. So I would guess home field is two points because that you can't be any closer in the rankings than those two are. So once again, Fairland at Portsmouth, it is more or less the OVC title game. As we said, Portsmouth coming into the game as it stands as a one-point favorite. For the Dragons, they're 6-0, a perfect record undefeated, 3-0 in the conference. New quarterback this year for them, Ethan Wall, uh, senior QB. He's over, and these stats are all through uh, the first five games of the season, so the Stats from game six have not mm-hmm. uh, had not been uploaded as of Monday at 8.40 p.m. Uh, but Ethan Wall, over 1,000 yards passing, over 10 touchdowns as well through just the first half of the season. And the thing for Fairland, and this is kind of something that um, differs between the two teams, is Fairland has a lot of guys that touch the football. Mm-hmm. Whereas for Portsmouth, it's predominantly two and you could say three or four touch it as well. But... You know, obviously, Wall touches it a ton. Keegan Smith, a senior wideout, leads the team in catches, reception, and in receptions, and is tied. Uh, I think I just said leads him in catches and receptions. Uh, leads that's, them in receptions, receiving a, yards, and that, receiving touchdowns. I mean, technically, it's you're same not thing. Wrong. Just said twice. Uh, he has 25 catches for 430 yards and four touchdowns. Jack Hayden seems to be Jack Hayden and Cam Kitts are both very. Um, do it all, guys. Yeah, if that's how you want to say it. For maybe Cam Kitts a little more than Jack Hayden, but Jack Hayden, 15 catches for a 171 yards and four touchdowns. Also has 18 carries for a buck 21 and two tutties. For Cam Kitts, a little more usage on the ground, 59 totes for 302 yards, five touchdowns. He also has 11 catches for 116 yards and a touchdown. So two uh, big PPR guys if uh, you yeah. play fantasy football. There are some other guys as well. C.J. Graham and Connor Black, two more wideouts. 15 catches for 111 yards for Graham. He also has a touchdown, and Connor Black has 12 catches for 129 yards and two touchdowns. So a lot of guys getting their hands on the ball for the Dragons. I think that's obviously a strength because, you know, defensively it makes it to where you can't really key in on one guy. You know, you can look at the stats and say, well, it seems like Smith, Hayden, and Kitts are – kind of the main focuses of the offense, but you have these other guys that uh, contribute heavily as well. They have multiple touchdowns and over two or 300 combined yards between the pair. So um, I think that's something we can look forward to this Friday for Fairland. Yeah, if you're able to spread the ball around, it makes it a lot more difficult to game plan for. And it, it appears that they got a lot of dudes that can, um, you know, make plays for them, get in the end zone. Uh, hopefully they're healthy. You know, we're, we're going to, kind of wait around and see on that what what we've been able to verify is we have been able to verify very much so just that they've got a bunch of guys that can go out and do it um yeah wall after not playing quarterback last year has been outstanding so far for Fairland, and and really they've been very dominant through six weeks I've, I've been really impressed with them that's why you know obviously that's why we have them at number two in our each of our rankings but i mean they beat Portsmouth West 34 nothing in yeah. week one, and, and we've seen West. Like, we saw West in week four. West three, won four games in a row. Yeah. West, four and two. So, they, they beat Point Pleasant by 17. Uh, the Fairfield Union score still is one that kind of is a little strange, but that was also one of the many weeks that it's rained. So, but still a 10-point win at Fairfield Union after you go two hours. Uh, Rock Hill, their only loss is a 35-point loss to Fairland. So, I mean – uh, then they put it on Guy Academy and South Point. So this is going to be a you know a big test for them on the road. The Sportsman team is very good. How good are they? I think we'll find out. On one Friday. point favorites. Yeah, apparently one. for the Trojans, yeah. they're five and one, three and zero oh in the conference, undefeated against teams in Ohio mm-hmm. up to this point. Just with that loss to Greenup County. Fun fact about the Trojans: the last three weeks they've outscored opponents one hundred twenty nine to eight. Uh, not too many teams in the state can say that. Yeah, uh, You're going to predominantly see Chase Highland, JT Williams, Cam Williams. Um, there are some other guys. If Trevor if, Brooks is one. Uh, Portsmouth. Nick Copley, if he's healthy. Uh, right. We, we did not see Nick Copley in week one. We're not 100% sure if he's back mm. to this point because we haven't received our 
uh, depth Every charts person, yeah. for both teams. So we'll see if he was back. Big part of the rushing game, a big part of the rushing attack last season. Th- there's some guys on the outside for them that, you know, it, for, for Portsmouth, it's predominantly going to be on the ground. But if Williams decides to go through the air, you know, Dontavian Parker, Landon Malone, um, I'm sure I'm Trevin Brooks. Scurlock, Leland. Yeah, Scurlock. I, I'm sure I'm leaving some guys out, but those are some of the names we saw in week one uh, and that we have seen in the box score throughout this season. So um, OVC title game on the line mm-hmm. here between these two teams. One yeah. point spread should be a lot of fun down at the Coliseum. Yeah, it's a it's a great place to watch, watch a game. Hopefully they got through it unscathed. I, I haven't seen anything one way or the other on how Portsmouth dealt with the flooding from the river, but – uh, we will find out soon. I think we probably would have heard something already if yeah. if it was in the bad. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful place to watch a game. Um, really nice setup for us there, and yep. hopefully the weather cooperates this week. But, yeah, it's it's not been the easiest schedule for Portsmouth. I know Valley is 1-5, and five, but that's not a super easy week one game. Uh, then they beat West 41-7 to seven in week two. So a similar uh, point differential, actually the exact same point differential <laughs> as Fairland had. Then they lost that game to Greenup County. Um, but as you mentioned, they've just drilled teams the last three weeks, which includes a good Colgrove team. They beat them thirty-four nothing. Colgrove four and two, and then Chesapeake, who's three and three, they beat forty-five to eight. So I mean, they they've put it on teams the last few weeks. Very good athletes. I think these are going to be two well-coached teams. Should be a lot of fun, as you mentioned, at the at the uh, Trojan Coliseum. It seems like Portsmouth very good at defending the run, mm-hmm. but it's also a lot easier to defend the run when the pass isn't much of a threat. Yeah. So, uh, obviously, this Fairland team very capable through the air. So, we'll see how Portsmouth can defend a dual-threat offense and we'll here see. in Week 7. And we'll see how good Fairland Defends the run (laughs) because (laughs) Chase Highland is probably, it's going to be a lot of Chase Highland. Uh, And the Williams brothers are, are really dynamic. So I'm excited just to see it's, it's going to be different. uh, I think a little bit like last week in the first half where it's going to be completely different uh, styles of play, at least in that first half of that Valley and Northwest game. Um, Now Portsmouth's a little more eye oriented, but you know, not the wing tee. Thank God. And uh, you know, this should be a fun game, you know, at least we know the the colors are very different also. Yeah. 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 There's no similarities in colors in this matchup. So it uh, should be a fun one. We'll move on to the next game we're going to talk about. We just got done talking about Lucasville Valley. Uh, they've got another matchup in the SOC2 coming up this week when they travel to the west side to take on the Senators. For West, one of the hottest teams in the area after dropping games to Fairland and Portsmouth. And Portsmouth, I couldn't remember who they lost to in week two. Uh, they've rallied off four wins in a row, including win over uh, Waverly, who at that time I think we had at number two or three in mm. our power rankings. Um, for Valley, their first win of the season, Aiden Wattell seemingly you know, a lot more comfortable in the pocket. I think they have a much more uh, dual-threat-oriented um, offense now. Um, you know, the, the backfield is obviously not the same without Gabe McNeil, but fortunately for them, you still have Anthony Aaron. Zach Witt lines up back there, can also go out and catch passes as well, can also push his quarterback into the yes. end zone uh, if need be. And then, um, well, like I said, I haven't spent a lot of time watching Valley this season, but I feel like that was probably Braxton Conaway's best game of the season. I mean, five for 105 and two touchdowns, it's hey, pretty solid. I about him bouncing back from that. Yeah, they didn't look like he would come back, and I think – he came back and caught a pass or two he, as well. Yeah. Um, and then you have Lex Logan, Isaiah Sparks, Blake Lundy. I think they all had grabs uh, in the win last week for Valley as well. So uh, they'll look to make it back-to-back wins here in 2024 and maybe try to make a late playoff push uh, here this season. And, you know, for West, I, I think fortunately for Valley, not sure if Mason Parker is going to play. Mm-hmm. Uh, the senior tailback left the Waverly game in week five after two carries. Uh, for what it's worth, he had like 18 yards on those, yeah. so he was still very dominant in the Duke carries he had. Uh, did not play against Minford in Week 6, which was last week. Um, so obviously that would be, be a big loss for Coach Gilliland and the Senators, as he's been the focal point for this offense for the last two seasons. Um, Anthony Bishop, just a sophomore. I thought he was maybe a wide receiver, but has obviously been utilized as a running back mm-hmm. the last two weeks. Uh, for Anthony Bishop, he now has back-to-back games with over 200 yards and at least four touchdowns. 
in those two games against Menford and Waverly. The sophomore has 510 yards and eight touchdowns all on the ground. So he has been nothing short of dominant for the Senators. And, you know, last week Brody Hall only attempted one pass. Bo Roten, the fullback, also had 13 carries for 44 yards. So it's going to be back-to-back weeks for Valley of facing nothing but run. And it's – I think – Northwest attempted just one pass, and it was like third and eight. So um, it's going to be the more or less the exact same thing, except va- or except, and we haven't seen West without Parker in person. But at least when they had Parker, they did line up in the spread or mm-hmm. s- more spread out than mm-hmm. what Northwest was. So you know, it, it's more or less the exact same thing coming Valley's way this week. Yeah, and I I think with you know what we saw with Bishop in Week Four was. They, they were starting to feed him a little bit, and I think they saw some good stuff. So when Parker went down, it wasn't much of a shock for them because they were able to to push Bishop into that role, and he's done, as you mentioned, just outstanding the last two weeks. Um, you know, When we saw Brody Hall, I thought he threw a pretty good ball. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not really much of a threat, but I think if you just completely ignore the pass, like they, they have the ability to – you know, to beat you with it. So this is going to be an interesting game. I think West is a little bit better at home uh, as they went to Menford last week. It's 24 nothing. I think they played that game on Saturday. So, um, but like, you know, you, you win your last two games against Chillicothe and Waverly at home. This is only their third home game in week seven. So they're going to be a little fired up. I wouldn't be surprised if this was homecoming. Um, I think we mentioned it was like they're an 11 point favorite right now. I, I think that's. And hopefully everything there is cleaned up as well. Yes. Yeah. Because there's a lot of water like going into West every once in a while, if it rains and we're driving down there, there's, there's roads. no way that Notre Dame stadium didn't get some right. water in it. Cause that yeah. is like right next to mm-hmm. it. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, we're hoping everybody down in Portsmouth, you know, was able to, you know, stay safe. Obviously everything that you, you keep seeing, like, I don't know if you see it on the news, but you see it on social media about the, the places in like North Carolina and stuff that are, it's just horribly hit. Um, like Portsmouth got it really bad too. So um, we hope everyone was able to stay safe and, you know, can watch this on, on electric because some people, I, I know um, like Southeastern schools didn't have school today because some of their people still don't have, still don't have uh power and that's in ross county in an area that's not really hit by the river so it's you know people were affected in a lot of different ways and hopefully uh you know the fields were okay and the people more importantly the people were okay right all right we can wrap it up with uh, our last preview here in week seven we're gonna talk about piketon and paint valley the kingston national bank game of the week here at sosa yeah, it should be, you know, for Piketon, you know, they they lost uh, Wellston early and got off, but they're off to a 3-1 and one start. But then they run into at St. Trace, Uniota, and Paint Valley, which are what we expected would be probably the top three teams in the SVC, yep. if not three of the top four. So, you know, they have them back-to-back-to-back weeks uh, after a home game against Uniota last week. Ended up being on Saturday, which uh, kudos to them for getting power because they definitely did not have power on Friday night when we, we drove back. Um, who, who are we talking about? Piketon. Piketon? Oh, yeah. man, Piketon was like a yeah. ghost town on yeah. the way back from Valley on Friday. So, yeah, so they were you know able to get together and play, scored a couple touchdowns. They had a, a bad snap or a bad hold on a – extra point then they had to go for two on their next one and because they didn't get either of those conversions it still put them a two possession difference which really you know hurt them in the end of that game but buddy wilson was really good in that game he had over uh he was nearly 200 yards of total offense i think he only had one catch in the game he was close to 200 yards rushing he had a 80 yard touchdown on the ground and a 30 yard touchdown on the ground uh luke gallian who's uh, 50-109 on the year, 827 through the air, seven touchdowns, three interceptions. He's also ran for 455 yards and eight touchdowns. Those are two big options in the backfield. Mason Thacker has 26 catches for 401 and five scores. 
not a whole lot in the last two weeks. Uh, I think he had one catch for two yards on Saturday. Now it also rained a lot, so they weren't able to connect on a lot of stuff. Uh, Luke Gallion did hit Zach Hanna downfield. It was like a 31-yard completion. It was over half of their passing yards on the on the one play. You know, I think they got to do what they can to get Mason Thacker the ball. Um, you know, we, we saw a couple times against St. Trace when he got touches that he was able to – you know, make some electric stuff happen. But when you, when you really got the three main guys that you get the ball to the receivers got to get the ball a little bit more. So I would look for them to, to maybe feed him a little bit more, try to get him, maybe get the ball to him in motion a little bit as well. White Savage is somebody who had a couple of good games early with buddy Wilson out. Um, they're going to have to find ways to score in this one because paint Valley has been really really good and we talked about isaac coy being really um you know really efficient on the year preston Faber has also been super efficient now i don't know if these are these are through five i think they were through five weeks on the stats but it may have only been through four but preston Faber and the stats i had 74 for 106 17 touchdowns only three picks um 1,068 yards through the air. He hasn't ran as much this year as last year. 120 yards rushing, but two touchdowns there. So 19 total touchdowns for the junior quarterback. Then a lot of seniors after that. Braylon Robertson, 881 yards through presumably five games. I'm sure he's over 1,000, as I didn't get the stats in from there. 37-0 win over uh, Adina on Saturday. Uh, six catches, 120 yards. He's got 13 total touchdowns. Carson Free, 29 catches. He's Paint Valley's all-time leading receiver. 321 yards and eight touchdowns. If he ends up being the all-time leading receiving... The rusher and the receiver yeah, on the same team. It, I know he's got the receptions lead, but I don't know if he has the receiving yards. If he has the receiving yards, then he's in like the top 15 in the state history because I was looking through that earlier and... Um, Chris Young, who graduated in 2003, was he was the state defensive player of the year in 2002 and is like a top 15 all-time receiver in the state. So uh, pretty good company there for free. And then Jeremy Keynes also had a really nice season so far, 15 catches, 296 yards, four touchdowns. So Paint Valley has a lot of different options to get the ball to. A lot of it's going to be run heavy with Braylon Robertson. Piketon hasn't done great against the run it was union's biggest game on the ground i think since week one against vinton county and that game was like three huge rushes against vinton county so uh and this one i think it's going to be you know how good can piketon slow down the pat or rush and then can they stop you know free and kane from making big plays in the passing game so should be an interesting game uh, Faber threw a good bit of interceptions last year and he, he has really calmed that down and, and really seems to have taken the next step, which is what's needed for Paint Valley. And now we mentioned haven't played the toughest schedule yet, right? Probably the toughest game they've played is coming up on Friday, but I, I look for them to still be pretty heavy favorites in this as, um, they are really rolling right now and Piketon coming off a couple of tough weeks in a row. All right, let's wrap up this week's show with some volleyball and some soccer recaps, and then we'll talk about um, a large handful of games coming up uh, this week that uh, maybe you get out and see if they're local to you. Yes. So uh, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. We kind of hinted at it last week. We didn't know that uh, people we we did not actually have coverage for it. But it was Notre Dame 3, North Adams 2 in volleyball last Monday. It, this one seemed pretty crazy. Um, Notre Dame wins 21-25, 26-24, 25-23, 23-25, and 15-13. Mm-hmm. So the biggest difference being four points. It just seemed like a battle throughout. Uh, Notre Dame was led by Macy Ford with 22 kills, Brian Hicks with 18 kills, three aces, 33 digs, Sophia Phillips only a freshman with 11 kills. And then we didn't do it in headlines because we were going to talk about it here, but Lindsay Schaefer, only a junior, gets her 1,000th career assists. She had 27 assists in the match, eight aces, uh, 11 digs. Uh, Maddie Entner had four aces, 23 digs, and 18 assists. So there's a lot of, you know, they they use a variety of different hitters, but they also have a couple different really good setters. 
the, one of the things I noticed in this match was there was a lot of aces overall. So I think yeah. both teams were really aggressive serving wise. This was uh, North Island's first loss. So Notre Dame at the time, uh, I think it was after the week is when I put the, the records in. 13-2, and 6-0 and in SOC 1 play. They've been outstanding, as always. Uh, we'll talk about them in a, in a game to probably watch for later. Uh, Eastern, uh, uh, yeah, it's three divisions in volleyball. Yeah. Never mind. Which I feel like I was told they decided, like, real late in the season. I was going to ask if Notre Dame had played Eastern yet. Um, I don't think. Or if they even do. I don't know if they do. You want to look that up? I can do that. Yeah. Uh, North Adams, 15-1, 9-0 in the shack. Um, <laughs> it's about shack time. Yeah. Uh, they were led by Caitlin Borger with 20 kills, four aces, four blocks, 21 digs. That's a that's a really good line. Because I feel like if you get five in those, it's... They it's do really play good. Notre Dame. When do they play them? 10-2. Uh, that's Sunday, isn't it? That's probably Saturday. No, 10-2 is... Wednesday. Is it on a Wednesday? Yeah. Well, yeah, because today throw is that out there. 930. Uh, 31. No, it's Thursday. Isn't no, it? no. 30, there's 31 no, there's days. not 31 days in September. I Tomorrow's the first. Oh, maybe you silly not. goose. Well, they play this week, Eastern and Notre Dame. Yeah, do. so that's, a, that's another game to get out and watch. I didn't put it down. I must have missed it. But uh, Aubrey Me- Mead with... 12 kills, 14 digs. Paige Evans, five aces, 34 digs. Then Natalie Reagan, 42 assists, 15 digs. Like, for North Adams, they had to go out. You know, they they, they pretty much dominate the shack. They go out and they, they schedule up and, you know, they lose. But, man, they, they played really tough. Notre Dame, whenever I was looking at the numbers, I think it's – I think they're Division 7. I think – South Webster was six. They're they're opposite of Webster. Either way, Notre Dame is by far the best team in their division. And North Adams is in five. Five is going to be really tough. But it's uh it seemed like a really good match there on Monday. And obviously Notre Dame um, has a couple more tough ones this week as well. Yep. Yep. With Eastern. Yes. Know, I was going to check and see if there was a final from Derek on um, – <laughs> on Man. that, but I'm not sure if he went or not because he had no Twitter updates. But he also told me he was driving there, so he probably took pictures. It's hard to tell. He focuses a lot on the pictures. <laughs> I'm so bad. You've taken pictures before, haven't you? Yeah, a little bit. I'm horrible at it. <laughs> like, I'm horrible at taking pictures and doing updates. But apparently, uh, the one game I took pictures for last year, Derek didn't use the pictures, so I must be worse at just taking pictures. Because there you go. That game, uh, Brock was doing updates. I was like, hey, let me take the pictures. And <laughs> and then we had no photo updates. So, go me. <laughs> but, like, the year before, it was, like, pretty decent. And I used the same camera. I don't know. I think, I think Derek just didn't want to pay me. All right. We got another match. This one, very close as well, but not quite as close as the previous yeah. one. Huntington beat Southeastern last Tuesday in five sets, so obviously 3-2, 25-21, 20-25, 25-14, 25-27, 30-31, 31-28, 31-29, 31-30, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 31-31, 
Huntington. Huntington. There you go. Their their match five matches before or was uh, a Saturday where they played three, um, and they went to three, and they Does won. That count? Are you counting that as? Like- I was saying like if you go back to yeah. So they've okay. they've played some sudden death. Some, yeah, there you yeah. go. When the when the match is on the line, Huntington really you know tighten or not tightens up because I don't want to say tightens up, but they really focus they in sack up. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, they've done really well. Um, obviously like just an outstanding season for the hunts people and, you know, in the township. And it was a, you know, it was really fun to be able to get out and watch that game. I had an interview after that, um, you know, with Casey Carroll and Leo McCloskey, you know, just really good kids. And it's exciting for them to have a senior year where, you know, they have a chance to play for a league championship on, on Thursday when they, right. when they host Adina, uh, they got to play better than they did the last time, but, uh, going to Southeastern who has to be one of the best, better teams in the state that is not even close to 500 in the league. I mean, four and six is not like super below 500, but still that's two games below, uh, 11 and six overall four and six in the SVC Jersey law. like I said, uh, in the headlines, she got her thousandth career dig in that match. She had 20 overall, 37 assists. Also, I believe she had like seven kills as well. So, uh, Kylie Dunn, only a freshman, 19 kills in the match. She had like three or four blocks as well. She's going to be really, really good. Uh, Gracie Brown had 19 digs. Reese Ruckel had 12 kills, five blocks. Jade Turner, also a freshman. She had four kills. One of those finished the fourth set. Also had 13 digs. This is a southeastern team that, you know, you're gonna lose. I I, I said Loggy is the only senior earlier, but she's not because the Ruckel twins are both seniors as well. So, um, my bad on that. So, but they 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 have a lot of youth. They play a lot of young players, and you know, while they're eleven six four and six in the league, you know, not where they want to be. But playing so many young players, you're gonna be, you know you're going to be better for it in the future. And they're probably going to be better for it playing with somebody like Lockheed. So, um, yeah, it was a really good match. Exciting to go five sets. I've been to two matches this year where I just kind of just went. Both went five. I'm going to have to start going to whatever games you go to because well, but mine have been you've also You've also been to two where I was at like three, sort, four, and three. Sort, of, sort of working one. And that was a three setter. And then the four set was like a cameraed, cameraed, videoed it. So, yeah. So, um, should be a big week for both teams. Uh, I, we, I mentioned Southeastern hosts Unioto tomorrow night as a game we're going to sort of talk about later. And then obviously, um, you know, Adina Huntington on Thursday. That's, yeah. the, that's the big one in the SVC this week. You want to wrap the, it up with our soccer game? Yeah, the the soccer game I got to go to on Thursday, Ironton St. Joseph won Lucasville Valley Cerro. It was under smacked. Uh huh. Said the under smacked. Yeah. And I had my umbrella out for the entire game, and I don't know if it rained hard at all. <laughs> I I got it out, and at that point, I was like. I'm not going to just stay here holding this umbrella. <laughs> so even though I don't think it rained much and especially after the first like 15 minutes, but uh, Carson Lyons for St. Joseph, who's now 11 and two, four and in the SOC Carson Lyons got fouled just outside the penalty box um, and scored on the ensuing free kick in the 22nd minute. It was, uh, you know, he, he saw where the goalie was and tried to place it a little bit backside of him hit off the bottom of the crossbar was able to bounce down and ultimately go into the net for the only goal it played without leading scorer wesley neal you know 25 goals on the year it still earned the win only one senior in the lineup that night and it was landon rowe who who i did the interview with him and carson lyons uh that was a good interview landon rowe like i don't know what ironton st joe does but their their senior soccer players are really well spoken. Um, last year had had an interview with one. It was it was probably the best interview I ever did. Landon Rowe was really good in this one as well. Uh, they are the smallest soccer playing school in the state. Yeah, I, I could have probably figured that. Yeah, and for them to be, you know, Valley's not like a metropolis in comparison. But I mean, 
you know, Valley does have the more, like some more options. Um, but it's a, you know, Ironton St. Joseph, 19, they had 19 kids on the roster. They, they did have one girl. So the girls weren't listed as player. Like it's listed as boys because it's boys soccer, but their boys in the school is listed at like 22 and they have 19 or 18 boys that play soccer. So, uh, pretty good for them. Uh, only one senior played that night, two seniors overall in the program. It's a, you know, a really good, really good soccer program down there. Now they don't have football. Oh, that's um, what happens when you have 15 dudes in your school. <laughs> yeah. You don't really have the option for it, but, uh, yeah, it's a good team. Uh, defense is Carson Willis, Brody West, Kemper Carrickman, Ian Whaley, um, played well. Freshman goalie Beckham Wagginger played really well as well. Had a couple of saves early, especially when it was raining and the ball skipping hard. He did a nice job. Now for Valley, they dropped to five, three and one, three and one in the SOC. Still have a chance to tie for the league whenever they play down at St. Joseph's in a couple weeks, probably next week, I would say. Uh, Chase Davis, Carter Ruby really were played really well in the midfield. Uh, Jackson Bender, you know, we talked about, I'm not going to assume his brother. I'm going to assume his brother, uh, you know, had the game winning field goal the other night. I think Jackson is on the football roster too. Maybe. I'm pretty sure I would have to go back and look at the email, but I'm pretty sure Jackson might be listed as the, uh, the backup kicker. So there could yeah. be another one. Uh, another yeah. Bender coming here. Yeah, uh, yeah. The backup kicker is Jackson Bender. So, yeah, which is makes he sense. a freshman or is he a sophomore? sophomore. So, probably only going to get one year out of him. But I'm guessing he's probably very yeah, if he's solid got, as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's a, he. He had a really good game. I, like that was. I saw them play earlier, and I thought their energy was better that night. Uh, I th- I think. He's probably going to have to be the one to score. I know he, he's one of their top scorers, as I mentioned last week. But um, that's the biggest issue I can see with Valley right now is they don't really – they don't have a go-to score where, you know, Arnton St. Joe has had like three guys that were over 10 goals already. Um, and I think that was Lions' 11th goal as well. So maybe they had four guys over 10 goals. So that, that gives you a lot of different options of people that know how to put it in the back of the net. And it's not the easiest thing to do is you have to kind of learn how to do it. I know when I coached middle school soccer one day, like we had missed a whole bunch of open goals. One day we just kicked into an open goal. I'm like, okay, we're just going to kick in the middle of it. Okay. Now let's kick to the side. And we're just trying to see the ball go in to just get your confidence up. It's almost like uh, when you're shooting, when, like you're just missing a take a layup <laughs> yeah you just make a layup just to you know start with a make it just to make yourself feel better um and that's why like whenever i golf i like to like finish holes because i lo- like seeing the ball go in makes me think oh i can make this next putt <laughs> even if i miss all of them so you know i i think it was a good game to watch um a lot of purple a lot of gold in that matchup yeah yeah and uh yeah it's fun. I, I don't know. I know there was a couple games on Saturday that were played. Um, Zane Trace beat South Webster 2-1. That was a really good win for Zane Trace. Um, I'm going to cover them on Saturday uh, whenever they go to Wheelersburg, just so I can get uh, some more eyes on them for that because I haven't got to see them, but they've had a nice season so far. Um, you know, Lynchburg beat Uniota 3-2 on Saturday. That's a good win for them. So, I mean, it's it's a... I don't know if there's a whole lot of soccer being played after the monsoon. I know some stuff was still canceled tonight. So, um, should be a good week coming up. That's about all we got. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we got some games to watch. We don't really have full on previews. So I just kind of went through, obviously I missed a big one because I missed that Eastern and Notre Dame game. Yeah. But, um, Tuesday, these are just some games. Like if you're in this area, try to go out and watch them. Uh, Logan Elm at Circleville. Union at Southeastern, Miami Trace at Hillsborough. That's probably an FAC championship game. I know Miami Trace beat them in three at Miami Trace, but kind of never know the second time around. So that one, those are on Tuesday. North Adams at Hillsborough on Wednesday. Where was that Notre Dame and Eastern? I believe it was at Eastern. Okay, Notre Dame at Eastern on Wednesday. Yep, it was at Eastern. Uh, Thursday, I got one. Adina at Huntington. Saturday, real big one. South Webster at Notre Dame. 
Okay, so that that'll be big in tournament seating wise. Yeah. Fun fact about Eastern: they are fifteen and two, and the only time they've gone, they've only gone to straight sets. Or excuse me, they've only gone to a fifth set once, and it was Piketon. with Piketon. The two losses, a three set sweep um, against Oak Hill, which that is obviously why they're seven and one in the SOC two. I'm not sure if that's right. I don't think there's. Well, yeah, I guess yeah. how many are in there? Five or six? Six. I can't remember all. Of yeah, them. six. So it should like should probably have ten total games. But they might have some like crossover games as well. I don't. I don't know for sure. Well, shouldn't they have? Oh, they did play Oakill twice. Yeah, they beat them three one the first time, and then lost three zero the second time. And that one, yeah, they lost on the road. So, mm. yeah, the Oakill is a cool logo. Yeah, it is good. Um, yeah, so those are some there's some volleyball games to look for. I, I'm sure there's some more that we're missing in there, but then some soccer games to look for. Uh, big ones uh, Tuesday, Menford at South Webster. I didn't see if. The one this next one on Thursday was boys and girls, but at least in boys, Athens at Gallia Academy be a big test for Gallia Academy to kind of see where they're at. Is right now they're looking like one of the top teams in Division Four with Wheelersburg, but haven't seen how well they've been tested so far. So that'll be a big one for them. And then Jackson at Circleville, especially on the girls side, or Jackson at. Chillicothe, especially on the girls' side, on Thursday. And then both boys and girls on Saturday. Zane Trace at Wheelersburg. Uh, I'm going to try to get down there for that. I believe it's 12 and 2. Please don't change it. And if they do, I hope they tell me. But um, also, District Golf will be played later this week. They were originally supposed to play tonight. I'm not sure if the courses are playable. Now, the good thing is they walk them. So you don't yeah. have to worry about destroying them with the golf carts. But uh, I don't think carts are going to be out for at least a couple more days because oh. it's it's still been raining. So, All yeah. right. Well, you know, get out, watch some games. I am not doing anything this week other than <laughs> that game on Friday. So uh, that'll be the next time I do something productive for Sosa. But, uh, and, uh, you're putting this out on Tuesday. Well, Tuesday. yeah, but I do that. I upload all that tonight, so I really don't do anything tomorrow. You could have lied. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing. I am doing, uh, we are doing three games next week, so that's yeah. four days worth of Sosa junk. Can't yeah. wait. Yeah, if you want to do, uh, we could skip overtime next week and do soccer on Monday. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it'll be uh, be a fun week. I think things really amp up. I don't like, I don't know if because everything's in on max preps, which, by the way, if you like calpreps.com, you hate max preps. Cal preps. Cal preps. That's where people do a lot of their, um, I don't even know if you can get on it. Um, but it's CAL preps, like California preps. Like, is it even up? We have reached a quick resolution with max preps. Okay. There it is. So apparently max preps was using Cal preps for stuff and just wasn't paying them. And like, it was like, in what they posted, it was like eight times in the last like five years <laughs> where they just haven't been paying them. So I think they're going to sue them. And Cal Preps was down for a while, which a lot of people use to like check scores and stuff like that. I don't understand. Like, I think it's like a very in-depth uh, website. I've looked at it before, but um, yeah. So I think with using Max Preps, I don't know if the tournament draws are going to be out this week. Or because I know there's only like a week left of the regular season in soccer and probably only a week left in volleyball as well. So I think we're going to see some tournament draws coming out very soon, which we'll talk about at some point. At some point. Once we figure out how the tournaments are working this year. All right. Well, a lot of good games to go out and see this week. Should be another exciting week of high school sports here in Southern Ohio. So unless you have anything else to add on, I think... We will get out of here and watch um, the rest of the Monday night games. Yeah. Um, my fantasy teams are terrible. That's yeah, it. Rasheed Rice is kind of hurting a little bit. Good guy. Not a good guy, but a good fantasy asset, I must yes, say. I was. enjoyed watching. Yeah, well, they did say something that, like, his – I would have to look it up. I got a – it says – uh, there remains uncertainty over the extent of Rishi Rice's injury, and more tests are required. So I don't know if that's oh. a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, I, just, a... I just saw on Facebook that the reason why Pete Rose uh, died was because they 
had a losing season. I'm serious. I just, oh, there we go. I just read someone said that. I'd say so. that probably didn't help, but yeah. uh, it was probably because he lost a bet on it. Do you think? <laughs> do you think like there being uncertainty over the extent of the injury is something that sh- I should be like happy about? I'm telling you that there might be. He might lose his leg. <laughs> It didn't even look that bad. I know. But I've neither did that guy for the Bears. Like, Chubb had that exact same thing, but his knee, like, actually, like, went the well, other Willis way. Well, Willis McGahee in the 2002 championship game, national championship game, his Will Allen exploded his leg, and he played for, like, 35 years in the league. I'm going to take it as a good thing. I think that they're trying to get him back this year. Maybe before, like, week 14 would be nice. He's not coming back this year. I bet he is. If he comes back, it's going to be in the playoffs. Not no. fantasy playoffs. He'll be he'll be back in time for the regular season. You're a liar. <laughs> Actually, you're a silly goose for that. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I think that's about all we got. Have fun this week. Goes to some games. All right. Well, that'll do it for this week's episode of Sosa Overtime, presented by Perfection One.